this is the problem of despotism. This is why despotism is, or even just authoritarianism, is all powerful and brittle at the same time. It's because it creates the circumstances of its own undermining. The information gets worse. The sycophants get greater in, in number. The corrective mechanisms become fewer and the mistakes become much wider and much more consequential. We've been hearing from voices both from the past and the present telling us that the reason for what has happened is, as George Kennan said, the great blunder of eastward expansion of NATO. Uh, a modern realist historian like John Mearsheimer tells us that a great deal of the blame for what we're witnessing now must go to the United States, that he calls it the great strategic blunder of the post-war era. So I thought we'd begin by your analysis of that argument. What we have today in Russia is not some kind of surprise. It's not some kind of deviation from a historical pattern. Uh, way before NATO existed in the 19th century, Russia looked like this. It had an autocrat, it had repression, it had militarism, it had suspicion of foreigners in the West. This is a Russia we know, and it's not a Russia that arrived yesterday or arrived in the 1990s. It's not a response to actions of the West. There are internal processes in Russia that account for where we are today. George Kennan was unbelievably important scholar, practitioner, person in our country and culture, the greatest Russia expert who ever lived. Uh, but I just don't think blaming the West is the right analysis for where we are today. When you talk about the internal dynamics of Russia historically, it reminds me of a piece that you wrote and was published in Foreign Affairs six years ago, and it began like this. For half a millennium, Russian foreign policy has been characterized by soaring ambitions that have exceeded the country's capabilities. Beginning with the reign of Ivan the Terrible in the 16th century, Russia managed to expand at an average rate of 50 square miles per day for hundreds of years, eventually covering one sixth of the Earth's land mass. And then say these high water marks aside, Russia has almost always been a relatively weak great power. So if, if you could expand on that and talk about how the internal dynamics of Russia have, have gone on to describe it both historically and in the present day under Putin, that would be, I think, very helpful. Uh, one of the arguments I made in my Stalin book was that being the dictator, being in charge of Russian power in the world in those circumstances in that time period made Stalin who he was and not the other way around. And so with Russia, what you've got is a remarkable civilization. You know it. You know it in the arts, in music, in literature, in dance, in film in every sphere, in science. It's just a deep, profound, remarkable place, a whole civilization more than just a country. At the same time, it feels that it has a special place in the world. It's a country with a special mission in the world. It's Eastern Orthodox, not Western. And it wants to be, it wants to stand out as a great power. Its problem has always been not that sense of self, not that sense of identity, but the fact that its capabilities never match those aspirations. And so it's in a struggle to live up to this aspiration that it has for itself, which it can't because the West has always been more powerful. Russia is a great power, but not the great power, except for those few moments in history that you just enumerated. And so in trying to match the West, or at least, at least manage the differential between Russia and the West, they resort to coercion. They use a very heavy state-centric approach to try to beat the country forward and upwards in order militarily and economically, as I said, to either match the West or compete with the West. So Putin is what he is, and no one has to tell you who Putin is. You've been on this for a very long time. At the same time, he's ruling in Russia and he's got these circumstances, almost a syndrome where geopolitics is trying to make up for a power differential that it can't make up for. Well, let's describe 
Putin and Putinism. What kind of regi regime is it? It's not exactly the same as Stalinism. It's not certainly not the same as Xi Jinping or, or uh, the regime in Iran. What are, what are its special characteristics and why would those special characteristics lead it to want to invade or why would Putin want to invade Ukraine, which seems, at least from this distance, singularly stupid? So of course, this isn't the same regime as Stalin. It's not the same regime as the czars either. Of course, there's been tremendous change. Urbanization, higher levels of education, the world outside has been transformed. So that's the shock, actually. The shock is that so much has changed, and yet we're seeing this pattern that they can't really escape from, where you have an autocrat or even now a despot who's in power making decisions completely by himself, does he get input from others? Perhaps we don't know what the inside looks like. Does he pay attention? We don't know. Do they bring him information he doesn't want to hear? That seems unlikely. Does he think he knows better than everybody else? That seems highly likely. Does he believe his own propaganda or his own conspiratorial view of the world? That also seems likely. These are surmises. So he believed, it seems, that Ukraine was not a real country. He believed that the Ukrainian people were not a real people, that they were one people with the Russians. He believed that the Ukrainian government was a pushover. He believed what he was likely told or wanted to believe about his own military, that it had been modernized to the point where it could organize not a military invasion, but a lightning coup to take Kiev in one, two, four, five days and either install a puppet government or force because he captured the current government and president to sign some paperwork. The courage of the Ukrainian people and the bravery and smarts of the Ukrainian government and its president Zelensky galvanized the West to remember who it was. What, what is the West? How to define what the West is? The West is a series of institutions and values. The West is not a geographical place. Russia is European, but not Western. Japan is Western, but not European. Western means rule of law, democracy, private property, open markets, respect for the individual, diversity, pluralism of opinion, and all the other freedoms that we enjoy, which we sometimes take for granted, we sometimes forget where they came from, but that's what the West is. And that West, which we expanded in the 90s, and in my view properly, through the expansion of the EU and the expansion of NATO, that West is revived now. And that West has stood up to Vladimir Putin in a way that neither he nor Xi Jinping expected. And so if you assume that the West was just going to fold because it was in decline and it ran from Afghanistan, if you assume that the Ukrainian people were not for real, were not a nation, if you assume that Zelensky was just a TV actor, a comedian, you know, a, a, a Russian-speaking Jew from Eastern Ukraine, if you assumed all of that, Maybe you could take Kiev in two days or four days or five days, but those assumptions were wrong. Let's discuss the nature of the regime, because it seems to me that the Putin regime changed somewhat, that Putin came in and there were, there were these figures called the oligarchs from the Yeltsin years. There were seven, eight, nine of them, and they were read the riot act, stay out of politics. You can keep your riches, but stay out of politics. And those who kept their nose in politics, like Mikhail Khodorkovsky were sent to prison and others left the country with as much of their fortune as possible. But we still talk about oligarchs. What actually is the nature of the regime and the people who are loyal to it and the people who are important in it? So you have a military police dictatorship in charge with a finance ministry macroeconomic team running your fiscal military state, and so those people are jockeying. Who gets the upper hand? Because for the macroeconomic stability, 
for the economic growth, you sort of need decent relations with the West. But for the military security part of the regime, which is the dominant part, the West is your enemy. The West is trying to undermine you. It's trying to overthrow your regime in some type of so-called color revolution. And so what happens, the balance of those groups shifted more in favor of the military security, let's call it the thuggish part of the regime. And of course, that's where Putin himself comes from. The oligarchs were never really in power under Putin. What he did was he clipped their wings. They worked for him. And if they didn't work for him, they could lose their money. And so he rearranged the deck chairs. He gave the money. He allowed expropriation by his own, quote, oligarchs, by people who grew up with him, uh, played judo with him, uh, uh, summered with him. And those people who were in the KGB in St. Petersburg, known as Leningrad back in the day, or were in post-Soviet St. Petersburg, those people began to become oligarchs, to, to expropriate the property, to live the high life. And some of the early Yeltsin era people were either expropriated, fled, or were forced out. And so he built a regime in which private property, once again, was dependent on the ruler. And everybody knew this. And if they didn't know, they learned the lesson the hard way. And sadly, sadly, what that did was it encouraged people all up and down the regime to the lowest levels to start stealing other people's businesses and property. It became a kind of free-for-all. If it was good enough for Putin and his cronies, it's good enough for me. But, what, so you, but such people in such a regime, it seems to me would care above all about wealth, about the high life, about power. Why would they care about Ukraine? It's not clear that they do. We're talking about one person here. We're talking at most about six people, but certainly one person as the decision maker. So this is the thing about authoritarian regimes. They're terrible at everything. They can't feed their people. They can't provide security for their people. They can't educate their people, but they only have to be good at one thing to survive, the suppression of alternatives. If they can deny political alternatives, if they can force all opposition into exile or prison, they can survive no matter how incompetent, no matter how corrupt, no matter how terrible they are. And so you have the denial of alternatives, the suppression of any opposition, arrest, exile, and then you have the ability to prosper as an elite, not with economic growth, but just with theft. It comes up right up out of the ground. The problem for authoritarian regimes is not economic growth. The problem is how to pay the patronage for their elites, how to keep the elites loyal especially the security services, the upper levels of the officer corps. And if, it, if money just gushes out of the ground in the form of hydrocarbons or diamonds or other minerals, the oppressors can emancipate themselves from the oppressed. The oppressors can say, we don't need you. We don't need your taxes. We don't need you to vote. We don't rely on you for anything because we have oil and gas, palladium and titanium, and fill in the blank, all the minerals that they have that they extract, which is all just cash flow. So it's not about economic growth, it's about cash flow. So they can have zero economic growth and still live very high on the hog in the elites. Now the West has decided for obvious reasons, not only not to go to war with Russia, but not to have a, a, a no-fly zone for all the reasons we know. And the, the, most, the greatest exertion it showed is in economic sanctions, which in fact have proved to be more comprehensive and more powerful than maybe people had anticipated some weeks ago. Um, but in the scheme that you are sketching out, it seems to me that at least for a good while, the people these are most aimed at will be able to absorb sanctions. Or do you think I'm wrong? The sanctions often 
inflict the greatest pain on the civilian population of Russia. And the regime can sometimes survive the sanctions because they can just steal more internally. And Putin doesn't have money abroad that we can just sanction, expropriate. Putin's money is the entire Russian economy. And so he doesn't need to have a separate bank account and certainly wouldn't keep it vulnerable in some Western country. The biggest sanctions and the most important sanctions are always technology transfer, right? It's always starving them of the high tech. We've seen Russian precision guided missiles being used in Ukraine and they couldn't even hit an airfield, which is pretty big. And that's because they don't have the microelectronics. So if you deny them over time through the Commerce Department, American-made software and American-made equipment and products, which affects just about every important technology in the world, and you have a targeted enforceable mechanism for doing that, you can hurt this regime and create a technology desert. And the Chinese cannot come in and substitute because they need that same technology that we're denying to the Russians. Moreover, the largest and most important consideration is that Russia cannot successfully occupy Ukraine. They do not have the scale of forces. They do not have the number of administrators. And they do not have the cooperation of the population. Steve what Sun Tzu, the great Chinese theorist of, of much, of, including war, hmm. said, always build a golden bridge for your enemy to walk across. In other words, create a situation in which your enemy can find a way, in this case, to stop a war. The United States should build a golden bridge or NATO should build a golden bridge for Russia to walk back this horrific and murderous action. What would that golden bridge be that would be acceptable to Ukraine and to the West as well as to Russia? One option is he shatters Ukraine. I can't have it. Nobody can have it. And he does to Ukraine, like you said, what he did to Grozny in Chechnya or what he did in Syria. And that would be an unbelievable tragic outcome. That's the pathway we're on now. Even if the Ukrainians succeed in their insurgency, in their resistance, many, many deaths, countless deaths and total destruction. So we do need a way to avoid that kind of outcome. And that would be catalyzing a process to engage him in discussion. The president of Finland, whom he respects and knows well, the Israeli prime minister, whom you know and has been in contact with him, less probably the Chinese leadership, Xi Jinping, engage him in some type of process where he doesn't have maximalist demands and it stalls for time for things to happen on the ground that rearrange the picture of what he can do. The more there's nothing to lose for Putin, the more he can raise the stakes, unfortunately. He has many tools that he hasn't used that can hurt us. We need a de-escalation from the maximalist spiral and we need a little bit of luck and fortune here, perhaps in Moscow, perhaps in Helsinki or Jerusalem, perhaps in Beijing, but certainly in, in, in Kiev. <laughs>